Thank you, Dr. Aiken, for taking the time to speak with me today. You're welcome. Happy to be here. I just want to dive in. If you could talk about your background, what you do, your journey uh, professionally in the field that you're working in now. Sure. You know, I'll, I'll kind of give you a little bit of background of how I got into motor behavior. Um, so when I was an undergraduate student, I was at the uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and I grew up playing a ton of sports. That was really my passion. And I took a behavior modification course um, and I was fascinated. So I grew up a big Atlanta Braves fan. Uh, and, you know, the story of Mark Wollers, where he kind of developed the yips, was always fascinating to me. And in this behavior modification class, I kind of realized that some of these 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 behaviors that we elicit, you know, are, are caused by a lot of different things. Um, and that kind of pushed me to go to graduate school for sports psychology. And it was in my graduate program at uh, University of Tennessee where I kind of realized a lot of these mental blocks, so to speak, that we end up with in sport are not necessarily caused just from a mental side. But oftentimes we do things within our sport practice that leads to poor performance, you know, when it matters the most. So I started to transition more into the motor control, motor learning side of things. Um, so when I finished up at the University of Tennessee, I went on to Louisiana State University and studied motor control and learning. Right. And, and really with the focus being, you know, how does practice affect performance? Right. How do we teach new uh, new learners to a skill, how can we maximize our time with them to ensure that they're able to learn a skill properly and that that skill maintains over time? Right now, in this point in your career, what, what are you focusing on or what are the directions or things you're most interested in and in, in studying and learning about and researching and the questions that you're trying to find answers to? Yeah, so now I'm at uh, New Mexico State University. I, I've been here for a little over five years um, at this point. And my research has a couple different veins that, that I'm really interested in, but probably the most important one really still focuses on, on practice manipulation, right? So it's really fun to go to, you know, conferences or give get guest lectures. And I always use Alan Iverson as my example, right? That, that I talk about practice, um, yeah. you know, that's really my focus. So my research is really heavily embedded in that. So, more recently, we've been looking at how we alter attentional focus. Um, so what an individual is attending to while they're learning a new skill and how that influences the learning process. Um, so we've, we've looked at different types of attentional focus. And, and recently, we've started looking at how individuals switch focus from one thing to another, or even how elite performers are using attentional focus within their skill to try to better understand how not only how we use attentional focus, but how we can manipulate it in a way to help people learn skills. I want to go into some of the papers that you've authored and co-authored and, and been a part of. But before that, I kind of just wanted to go through some terminology for listeners to understand. So when we talk about focus, to start with internal focus, external focus, what does that really mean? So for people who don't necessarily understand what the difference is. Yeah, and, and you'll hear those things a lot from me. When we talk about yeah. attentional focus, it's it's really what an individual is attending to cognitively while they're performing a task, right? So, you know, if you're putting a golf ball, thinking about, you know, where the, the cup is, you know, or whatever it is that you're focusing on. So an internal focus is a an attentional focus instruction or cue or, you know, um, direction where you're focused on the body. Right. So it might be, you know, focus on making sure that I have proper mechanics when I'm swinging a golf club. Right. And then an external focus would be a focus on the end result of your movement. Like, so what effect does your body have on the environment? So it may be rather than focusing on the mechanics during that putt, you know, just focusing on the cup uh, and, you know, making sure that that's your primary focus while performing the skill. And I've also read. Uh, one paper where they they were looking at task relevant versus irrelevant mm -hmm. tasks. So would irrelevant tasks, for example, they had people hitting a putt while counting random numbers and something not, would that be considered an external focus as well? Or is it not because it's not, part, it's not related to the movement in any way? Yeah, because it's not related to the, like the end goal, right? Because an external focus is, what is your movement going to do on the environment, 
Like, so where's the ball going to land or, you know, something like that. So focusing on, on different number sequences would just be a secondary task. Um, and it's really distracting you, but it doesn't fall within that, that strict category of attentional focus. Okay. So in terms of defining it, it would be considered a secondary yeah. task. And some of these next terms are things that I was, when I was reading your, your, about you online, I really don't necessarily know, but I wanted to understand them. So one of them is contextual interference. What does that mean? Yeah. So that's, you know, I'm not surprised you brought that up. The one paper I think I published using a golf task was within contextual interference. Um, yeah. So, you know, really we talk about more of the contextual interference effect. And this idea is that the more interference that you can introduce during practice, um, the more errors you create, but it leads to stronger representations within learning. All right. So when we talk about contextual interference, we look at things like random or blocked practice. And a random practice would be where you're practicing multiple skills in a random order. So they're each interfering with the other tasks that you're practicing. Right. And this has been shown to enhance learning over longer periods of time. Right. So when we talk about contextual interference, it's really about figuring out ways to interfere with the learning process or interfering with that context that you're practicing a skill in. Okay. Interesting. So you're saying that, and from the research, the more you're able to interfere and kind of mess with what's going on, the more there's actual well, learning going on. Yeah. And it, you know, it, it's interesting because you do that and you end up with really bad practice where there's lots and lots of errors. Um, but we see better performance on like retention or transfer tests, which are a better indication of skill learning. Um, and then a group that uses low amounts of contextual interference might do really well in practice. But when you alter something on the testing sequence, they perform much worse. Right. So sometimes it's, wow. you know, I remember as a kid, coach is always saying, you know, it's not about, um, you know, practice makes perfect, but it's perfect. Practice makes perfect. Right. Then the idea is that that's mm -hmm. just not true at all. You know, we want to see lots of errors in practice. You know, that's your chance to make those mistakes so that, you know, you carry on and have good performance when it matters the most. Wow. And I think when we come back to practical ideas, takeaways for coaches and players, I think that already there is, is really valuable. Oh, okay. I don't have to create practice environments that are there's no failure. Everything's perfect. That's probably, it might make you feel good or it might make you seem like you're learning, but it doesn't actually hold up in, in other situations. Right. Right. Yeah. We want lots of variability in practice because when you go out to perform, it's not going to be the exact same thing you practiced. Right. So you have to be prepared to adapt to any new environment or any change in skill. The next one I wanted to cover which to me, I think relates directly back to internal focus, external focus is this explicit monitoring hypothesis. I've been trying to learn about, um, but I'd love to hear from you kind of what, what does that mean? What is its relevance to, to the work that you do? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, it's not something that, that I talk about often, right. But the explicit monitoring hypothesis is this idea that we're when we're in a high pressure situation, um, our focus tends to switch to the processes of how we perform a skill, which really aligns nicely with an internal focus of attention. So the idea here is like when we're feeling pressure, we're in a pivotal moment of, of performance or competition, we tend to think more internally, which has been shown to degrade performance. Right. And, you know, I, I know that you're a golfer. Um, I, I pretend that I'm a golfer, right? But, you know, when I'm out playing and I, you know, make a bad shot, immediately I started thinking about what did I do wrong? What, what was wrong with my mechanics? Did I, did I turn my wrist over? Did I rotate my wrist incorrectly on the shot, right? And then when you start thinking about those, you're more likely to do the same thing on the next shot. So when the, the explicit monitoring hypothesis just goes back to this idea that, when pressure's on, you start to think about your body and the mechanics, which degrades your performance. Okay. And to me also, I think we'll get to that later is okay. At least when I'm coaching, I'm trying to think, how do I combat that? Because based on that hypothesis, I don't want players to be focusing, having an internal focus under pressure and competition 
necessarily because that's bringing more attention to the movement, the mechanics of, of what they're, they're doing. And so related to that, this idea of declarative versus proceduralized knowledge, that's a concept that sort of relates to this monitoring hypothesis, or I believe in terms of, you know, a beginner versus a more advanced person. Can you talk about what those terms are? Yeah. So declarative knowledge are, are basically things that we know that are very easily to easy to verbalize, right? Like, you know, we know what color the sky is, or, you know, we know what, um, you know, we know what gravity is, things like that. And we can explain what those things are fairly easy. Uh, when we get into procedural knowledge, it becomes much harder to verbalize where it's more about how we do something, right? And this is really the challenge for coaches is, you know, something, right? You kind of know how to do it. You can do it without a lot of attention, but when you have to explain how to do it, it becomes a lot more challenging, right? So these, these sports skills that we're teaching are these, these procedural knowledge skills. Um, they're hard to verbalize. So coaches have to figure out how they're going to explain to do these things, which is our interest and attentional focus. Cause oftentimes we start to think about those internal processes and, you know, focus your hand, you know, make sure you grip a club this way, focus on your hands here, or, you know, focus on rotating your hips correctly. And we use these internal cues um, when we're trying to explain what we know how to perform a skill. I guess, is it true that then the more advanced you get, things become more proceduralized? You just know how to do things? Like you start out more declarative or not necessarily? So I don't know if, if that's like how I would categorize it, but the more skill that you gain, the harder it becomes to teach somebody to do that skill, right? Because... As mm -hmm. they move further and further away from what, how a beginner approaches a skill, they no longer know how to verbalize it and make sense, right? Which is why, in, you know, we see this in the NBA a lot. We take an all-star and we say, hey, you're going to coach this team now. And it's not always successful right away. You know, we've seen lots of Hall of Fame players mm -hmm. become coaches and fail at that aspect of, of their professional career, right? And, and part of it is they just don't know how somebody approaches a skill that performs at a level lower than they did. Um, so that there's the challenge with coaching right? is, is to be able to understand how a beginner or somebody at a lower level than you is approaching things and thinking about things and helping them improve. Um, it's, it's, it's a challenge, right? Like I have, I have young kids, you know, they're, you know, they're in, in elementary school, but think about teaching a kid how to jump, right? Like jumping is something so easy. We all know how to do it. But telling a you know two year old to to you know bend their knees and like spring forward and lift themselves off the ground, you look at a two year old, they'll do it, but they don't ever leave the ground, right? So oftentimes we we kind of mm -hmm. discover and learn some of these procedural things on our own uh, without instruction. And so now that we've kind of gone through all these terms, kind of one by one, I really want to focus on your uh, some of the research findings. So the first one is a paper titled. Utilizing an internal focus of attention during preparation and an external focus during execution may facilitate motor learning. So very intriguing title when I read through it, but I wanted you to, if possible, share the findings that you came across or key points that you'd want listeners to listeners to know yeah, about. Yeah, so this was this was a fun paper that uh, Kevin Becker and I worked on for for quite a few years, to be honest. Um, so he published a paper, I don't remember the exact year, uh, where he looked at this idea of switching attentional focus and he had people doing a standing long jump and they switched from preparation to execution, um, with, you know, an internal focus to an external focus or vice versa, or keeping an internal focus or keeping an external focus. And he found that the groups that had an external focus during execution, um, outperform those that use an internal focus during execution. And assuming I remember that, it's been a few years since I've looked at it, right? And it was this, this, this really cool thing that attentional focus may not matter a whole lot the entire time, but as long as you're focusing externally, when you go to execute a skill, that's what's important, right? So as, as Kevin and I talked about that, we, we started talking about skills like golf, Right, where it's very common where you're going through preparation. You see golfers take multiple practice swings, right? And they're going through kind of their own checklist to kind of mentally or physically prepare for the next shot. And, and we thought it seems like 
people are oftentimes using internal focus here, right? You'll even see half swings, right? Where they're just kind of working on the, the right rotation or the right me mechanics. So we wanted to see if we could kind of use some of the benefits of an internal focus to teach proper mechanics, so to speak, right? But then still having them switch to an external focus right before they perform a skill to see if we could get this additive benefit. So in our study, we looked at individuals that had just an internal focus, just an external focus, or a group that during a preparation phase, they focused internally. And then when they stepped to the line to actually execute a chip shot, they switched and started to focus externally. Um, and, and I would say, you know, what we found was, and so our, our take home message from this is that switching led to superior learning. Um, however, it was not as clear as we would have liked that to be. Uh, we originally tested a whole lot of participants and we didn't find anything. Um, we didn't even find a benefit for an external focus, which is, which was a bit concerning. So we kind of dug through our data and looked to see what was going on. And, and we realized that a lot of our novice participants didn't focus on what we asked them to do at all. <laughs> um, you know, surprise, right? Undergraduate students come into a lab and they don't listen to you, uh, especially when they're psychology students and they just assume you're lying to them in some way. So once we <laughs> removed the people that didn't adhere, didn't really listen to our instructions and admitted they didn't focus on what we asked them to, we redid the analysis and that's where we found the benefit for that switch, um, which was pretty exciting. Like I said, it wasn't as clear as we would have hoped, but the idea was coaches use internal cues or internal foci all the time when they're teaching a skill, right? And we even see that with elite performers. So coaches can't be wrong in every situation like this. So we we're hoping to see that you can use, you know, the benefits of teaching mechanics but as long as you, when you're executing, you really focus externally, there's like this additive benefit. And we didn't necessarily see that, but we're going to keep doing some additional research to see how we can interplay these two different attentional foci um, to kind of help progress learning a little bit. Okay. And so were you looking at, you said in terms of learning or were you judging performance outcome? Or what was your, what were you trying to see? Like did, were they, which out, which combination resulted in the best outcomes in terms of the chip shots or the best tr transfer of, of yeah, learning? So that, that's a really good question. In, in motor learning research, right? You can't ever observe learning, which, which is really fun to say, right? The whole thing I study, you actually can't observe it. Um, but we <laughs> use different measurements to make inferences about learning. One of those may be that they're performing better. Right. Or that we're seeing their their performance increase over time. Um, so we look at a little bit of that. But really what's become more common is looking at retention and transfer tests and a retention test. Right. So like they come back the next day or a week later, a retention test would be testing them on the same skill that they practiced. And that's supposed to kind of check in to make, to make sure that that skill is retaining, you know, over time. Um, and then a transfer test is where you increase, you know, you add some hiccup, right? Some change in variability. Maybe they're chipping from a further spot. Maybe they're chipping at different targets or whatever that might be. Right. And that's looking to see if people are adaptable because, you know, when you go out on a golf course, no two shots are the same. Um, you know, I, there's a, a course that I like to play in Las Cruces called Red Hawk. And if they didn't mow that day, you know, you end up in a different area and it's a different shot or, you know, you end up on a hill in a different spot. The, the swing changes a little bit. All right. So we want people to be adaptable to whatever environment they come up with, uh, which is why we use those transfer tests. So in, in this particular study, we were really interested to see what was happening within retention and transfer, not so much during the practice sequence, because we thought having people switch attention, they may perform worse, but we really wanted to see if they retain that information, you know, um, you know, after they, they walk away for a day or so. And just to be, to clear, at least to clarify for myself from your research there or your knowledge within this field, is there any support for an internal focus being beneficial during the actual to perform with an internal focus? So in general, the research research would say no, 
Um, there's been a, a number of studies that have shown an immediate performance benefit for an external focus, right? Like all of the long jump studies, they're not really practicing. You're just saying, hey, do two jumps with this focus, two jumps with this other focus. And they've consistently shown an external focus to be better. Um, but those are also skills that have this really clear cut external focus, right? So if you're jumping, you know, jump as far as you can get as far away from the starting line or as close to an, an external object as possible. Um, so I don't know of anything that has specifically showed a benefit to an internal. I, I know there's a few papers out there that have shown that, but, you know, unfortunately with research, when we see something happen a lot, we tend to prioritize findings that show that same thing. Um, when experts have been looked at, the, the results have not been real clear. Um, there's a number of papers that have shown if you don't mess with their attentional focus at all, they perform the best, right? If that you, if you change it in any way, internal or external, okay. their performance might deteriorate. So there's, there's, we need more research kind of with that elite population still. And the second paper. So the second one I want to talk about is considering a holistic focus of attention as an alternative to an external focus. So could you talk about what this holistic, uh, holistic focus of attention is and the findings. Yeah, and that I paper. really have to give uh, credit to the, the first author on that pa paper, my colleague, Kevin Becker. Um, he, he brought, you know, this really interesting idea with this holistic focus to me and said, look, there's these times where we're performing sports skills where an external focus just makes sense, you know? Um, and he was a, a Highlands game competitor, you know, where they throw giant telephone poles and things like that. Right. You know, and, and he would think about some of the skills and stuff that he would do. And, and typically you can kind of focus externally about how you want to, you know, manipulate the implement that you're using or, you know, the effects long term on the environment. Right. But then there are certain skills where like a pirouette in ballet, where it, there's not a real clear cut, you know, external focus. You know, as, as people are spinning around and their environments changing, it's, it's hard to pick a certain focus cue. So he, he was also a, a hammer thrower in college. So that's kind of where like these spinning movements and how do you create these really solid cues of an external focus for a coach. So he went into this idea of a holistic focus or this general feeling of a movement, you know, feeling powerful or feeling smooth or explosive and to see if we could use those type of, of cues or the, those type of attentional foci to alter performance in some way. So in the paper that we did, we used a standing long jump because it's been used so many times in the literature. It was a way to kind of check this new manipulation. And we found that both the holistic focus where they were just told to focus on being as explosive as possible and an external focus that was told to jump as close to, a, I think, an external cone as possible right? Both, you know, outperformed an internal focus, right? So it was pretty exciting to see that this, this manipulation where we just said, be explosive, they were performing in a way similar, um, to the research that's shown a benefit for an external focus for, you know, 15, 20 years. Um, so that's really where, where we came from. This is as, as a, from a coaching perspective, it can be pretty hard to figure out how to use an external focus with everything. So are there other focus types we can use to maybe still get at those benefits. Very interesting. So it's for those situate. I've also found for me, example, in golf, I find short game putting, it's very easy to, to use an external focus, but sometimes on longer shots, it, it's not as easy because on a short shot, you can mm -hmm. see, like, I really can see where the ball is intended to land. Whereas on a longer shot, you know, that's 200 yards away. You're not really like you can have a, a, a line visualize it, but you're not really going to see where the ball is is going to land necessarily, or how it's going to land and what it's going to do. That's just my personal opinion, more so and an experience. So I, I think that's an interesting idea. of This holistic seems to be an option then to bridge the gap when it doesn't seem like an external focus would necessarily apply in the sport. Yeah, or in the and context. that was really our idea. You know, and I agree with you with, with golf. You know, on a long par five. When I've still got 270 yards to go on the second shot, um, 
you know, I'm not putting my ball within a, a you know, a five meter or five foot range that I'm looking for. It's, it's, let's just stay within this, this area, you know, now obviously professionals are probably a little different, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it can be really hard to maintain a focus, especially when it's so far away. Um, I do know that there's been some golf instruction that's used what they call a club focus, you know, and ensuring that your club is kind of pointed towards the target, which would really get at this idea of an external focus. You know, if, if here's your line, here's kind of where you want your ball to land 200 yards away, yeah. making sure that during that swing, your club is pointed towards your intended target. And that tries to help build an external focus within the individual. Now, one thing I wanted to return to, we talked about internal focus, external focus. I was, the third was the, um, I forgot the term when I gave you the example of a, a random task as a secondary task, I think is the term we, we use. From your experience or knowledge in this area, how does this, uh, having a secondary task hold up? Is that also something that can be useful? And specifically, I'm thinking of performance breakdowns, from a, not from a learning necessarily, but from a, a performance yeah, under pressure situation. Yeah, so there has been some stuff. And, and I have to admit, I'm not as familiar with it as I should be. right? But I know that there's a couple papers out there that have used a secondary task within external focus. I don't remember exactly what the results are. Um, I've been working on a paper with, with some colleagues and they were looking at, you know, trying to increase cognitive load um, under internal external focus of attention. And in some of those preliminary results, it's not published yet, they have found that an external focus was better when you're increasing the cognitive demand on somebody, right? So in this, they were using a secondary task of uh, it was like a tone recognition, hearing two different tones while you were performing a skill and being able to identify which one you heard, right? So you're increasing that cognitive demand. And they found that the external focus kind of helped alleviate some of that. So now I wanted to switch gears a bit and talk from your experience and the research you've done, relevance for golfers or at least for, for athletes and coaches. So really, you have a my first question is, how can coaches and golfers slash athletes abide by scientific principles to optimize skill acquisition and motor skill transfer? Yeah. So, right. That's, that's really a million dollar question. You know, I think if I could you know, hundred <laughs> percent answer that, you know, I, I'd make a whole lot more money than I do, but you know, there, there's a couple that I think are really important. One is, you know, don't be afraid to try something new, right? At the beginning of kind of this, this chat we're having, we talked about, you know, variability, right? And I think increasing variability within practice is really important, you know, especially within golf, you know, we, we go out to a driving range and you see it, especially with beginners, they grab a bucket of balls, you know, pull out their, their seven iron and, and they go to work for 20 minutes, right? And, you know, we have very little variability, right? We're doing the same thing over and over again. And then when you go out to play around, like, I hope you're not swinging that seven iron more than once in a row. Um, you know, that we're constantly switching and changing what we're doing. We very rarely have this really nice flat grass, you know, that's just perfectly manicured to, uh, to hit a seven iron off of, you know, so we need to find ways to increase variability as much as possible. Um, I think the other, the other cue, the other big thing that I would focus on, you know, and focus is kind of a fun word is, is to realize that when things are going bad, what are we focusing on and when can we change that? So if we recognize we're starting to think about our hip rotation or our shoulders or whatever it might be, what is an external focus that we can use to kind of snap us out of that? You know, so rather than thinking about the errors that we've made, start to think about that next shot kind of adopt some form of an external focus of attention um, to keep yourself progressing and moving forward in, in that round. Okay. And that kind of brings me to my, my next question was going to be, what should golfers focus on when we talk about the execution of the swing? So not, not necessarily a practice swings or on the range, but if we're talking about I'm under pressure, I need to deliver. Do you have any recommendations for what type of focus to take while performing? 
Yeah. So the, the conventional wisdom and the things that's, that's more supported by research would be to adopt an, an external focus of attention. Right. And there's, there's been some work that have shown that when you adopt a focus that's further away from the body, it's better. Right. So maybe thinking about a general area where you want your ball to land and really focus on that and allow the body to kind of do what it does best and organize the movements and carry out a movement form that's going to get the ball to the area that you're looking for. Um, you know, there's, like I said, there's been some things on like a club focus, you know, focus on, on having the club point to the external target. And those are great too. I think that's probably more beneficial for beginners, but as you're kind of progressing, you really want a, a large focus to be on, you know, what is the trajectory of the ball you want? What's that flight path going to look like? You know, if you're hitting a fade or draw, what's that curvature going to look like to get the ball to land in a general area that you want it? And from my understanding, this also relates to this idea of the ex, uh, explicit monitoring hypothesis. Having this kind of external focus is less likely going to allow us to interfere with this automatic golf swing. It's going to allow us to probably swing more freely and just execute how we know how to execute as opposed to if we're having an internal focus on the mechanics of what we're doing. Yeah, so we often use what's called the constrained action hypothesis. And this is an idea that when you use an internal focus okay. and you start thinking about the body, it's constraining the motor system to perform in a non-optimal way, right? But when we use an external focus, we kind of release that. We're not constraining the motor system and allowing the system to perform in more of an automatic way, which is what kind of drives those beneficial, you know, effects that we see. And that's that very sounds very similar to the explicit monitoring hypothesis, or is there a, is there a major difference in that? Yeah, it, it gets to a similar principle. From what I know about the explicit monitoring hypothesis, it really is about pressure. Um, you know, where where you're going to okay. kind of start to change and, and focus more internally. Right. Whereas the constraint action hypothesis is more of a general, you know, um, model that when you focus internally, you're constraining the motor system. Uh, when you focus externally, you're able to kind of perform more in an, in an automatized way, which is better for performance. And now just to kind of clarify what we talked about earlier, if we're not talking about performance under pressure, just from a skill acquisition technique work, internal focus would be, there would be reason to use an internal focus when trying to learn or teach somebody. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think that, you know, an internal focus, when we've looked at coaches, you know, we've seen coaches using it, right, that are very effective coaches. Um, you know, I, I know there's some literature out there looking at high level runners and they use an internal focus. So it, it can absolutely still be used when you're teaching mechanics to a skill. I think the big idea is that, you know, especially when we're working with, with novice learners, you don't want them focusing in, internally when they're actually swinging the club to hit a ball. Um, that's where we really need to drive their attention away from those mechanical processes. And so one thing I also believe I read in your research is this idea about difference between novices and experts in terms of variance and variability in their in their movements or when they're executing something could you talk about that a yeah bit? so one of the things we look at to to understand skill learning or skill performance is is variability right so when we're new at a skill the, the amount of variability that we express is really large um think about somebody learning to swing a golf club right every swing looks different the the outcome is different on every swing Right. And as, as somebody starts to learn a skill, they start to trim that that um, that variance down and they become more and more consistent over time. Right. And that's really what we want to see with with our high level or elite performers is that there's this maintained consistency that, you know, when they step up to a tee box, they're able to hit, you know, a very, very similar shot um, over and over again. Right. Because if if they're not consistent with that, they end up with the next shot that's really bad, that's hard to recover from, right? So in general, experts are going to have, you know, a lot of, of, of consistency in their movement form and in the outcome, whereas beginners are kind of erratic and they're all over the place. But even at the expert level, there is still variance, right? It, it's because I've also read about this, mis this 
idea of people falsely believing that if they make a swing every time, it should be identical at the movement gets repeated every time identically, but actually a mark of an expert performer is that there, there are slight variants. The result is the same, but there are slight variances in their performance, not major ones, but there is still my smaller variance in their movement from swing to swing or from movement oh, to absolutely. movement. Absolutely. Right. Like if you think, you know, the amount of muscle fibers we're using and, and neurons used to kind of control these movements, it's, you know, in the, the billions, right? So every movement that we perform is never going to be identical to the movement we performed before, right? Um, in, in some famous motor behavior literature by uh, Nikolai Bernstein um, many decades ago, right? It's it, this famous piece where he looked at expert blacksmiths swinging a hammer and they kind of tracked the movements of the hammer. And what was amazing is that every single um, strike was happening in the exact same location, but the path of the hammer to get there was different every time, right? So when we're swinging a golf club, right, every swing is going to have some subtle differences where we don't want the variability to be is in that impact spot, right? We want to make sure that we're striking the ball in the same spot with the club every time, right? But how the body moves to get the club to that exact spot is going to be slightly different every time. And I think he turned, he coined the term Repetition without yeah, repetition. Yeah, exactly. Right. Which, which is fun. I, I, which I think that's a really good analogy for golf to, to think about that concept for golf. Like, oh, swinging, a, you know, a blacksmith swinging a golf club. But you raise a very important point that, yes, we want to strike it the same spot every time. Otherwise, you can't play good golf. But the movement, while there's consistency, there's limited variance, it's experts still have variance in their movement, even if they hit the same spot ultimately. Yeah. I mean, we're not able to, to, you know, um, you know, use our muscles in the exact same way every single time we do something, right? Like that's what robots do. Um, and you know, our body is, is built to have a little bit of variability in everything we do, which is important because if you have some type of an injury, right, that you're still able to produce movements, we're able to overcome different obstacles and situations because we're able to increase the variability in that movement when needed. So if I kind of summarize what I've heard you say, the key points, if you're a coach or a golfer or a player, trying to take chances in terms of try new things to create more interference, right? To create more variability in your, in your practice, because that's going to help actually with retention and transfer of skills, as opposed to just repeating the same thing over in practice. Mm -hmm. So that, that seemed to be one major key. And then generally having an, an external focus during performance or uh, what you call the holistic one, depending on the context you're using it in to perform would, would probably be advisable. And I guess the last part we just talked about to me would the part that stands out would be an understanding that, okay, I don't need to expect to repeat everything exactly the same. Cause I think in golf, there's probably a lot of people that think obviously you want to strike the same spot, but it's not a realistic expectation to actually move the exact yeah. same way every time. Yeah. There's, there's no way we can do it. Right. The, the body is just not going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think one of the, the other things that awesome. I would say, um, and this is probably not a real popular opinion, so you can delete this later if you want. Um, but you know, I, I would caution both coaches and players to to be careful with new technology, right? We, we've kind of entered into this world where there's a new technical technological advancement every week, especially within golf, you know, where we've got to use all these different things. And it's not tested. We don't know if it actually improves performance, if it's going to make a lasting impact. Um, so I would, you know, caution, you know, individuals of using all the the new things out there and, and waiting to see if it really does improve your performance. Um, but you know, golf's a billion dollar industry. Um, people want to, you know, shave off one or two strokes. So they, yeah. they dump money into whatever new thing comes out. And, and I see a lot of it out on the golf course and a lot of it, I think from a motor behavior standpoint, you know, it's kind of like, it's probably not going to change your behavior much. Um, you know, so it's something to think about as a coach, you know, make sure you're using technology that's, that's sound, that there's been proven results, not just a spokesperson saying, 
hey, this worked for me, so you should use it. I think that's a very, very important point you raise. And also, I think with the more technology that's available, coaches have to mm -hmm. understand how to use it effectively. Because I can definitely see, I use a lot of technology in my coaching, and I work at an academy that use has fantastic technology, but it's great in diagnosing and helping you understand mm -hmm. things that you can't see with the eye, right? You can't see the movements. And with this technology, you can really understand what's going on from different perspectives, what the, what you're, what you're doing in the ground, what your club is doing, what the ball is doing. And then it's on the coach or the player and the coach to take that information and create cues and foci, foci and develop the player. Whereas nowadays it's very easy to just kind of groove a swing and become good at swinging the golf club, but not necessarily be good at playing golf. Yeah. You know, I think one situation and, and you guys may have it there is when we use motion capture, right? You, you take biomechanics research and, and we, we put these, you know, three markers and we look at a 3d model of, of what the person's doing. And you can say, Hey, here's where the force is not transferring correctly. Right. But then being able to take that information and actually instruct somebody to make those changes is really hard. Um, you see a lot of those practices in, in towns all over where you can go do a 3D assessment of your swing, but they can't tell you how to fix it. They can just tell you what's wrong based on this model that they have, right? So coaches have to be able to take some of that technology too, where it diagnoses issues and then know how to use instruction to change the issue that you're seeing. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, and that's makes it more challenging. I think in the modern day now to be a, uh, a, a good coach in the sense of, uh, be able to help your students because you have to understand a lot more. Whereas, you know, decades ago there was less technology. You had less resources. You had to get by with what was there and do the best you could. But now we can understand, we understand so much more about the golf swing but just understanding it is how do we, you know, it's like having data for the sake of data. Like, mm -hmm. what do we do with the data? How does it help us in any way to actually make right. informed decisions? So to conclude, I wanted you to share any projects, anything you're working on, anything you at the university, your team are working on. And then the last question is, if you have any book recommendations, could have nothing to do with your field of work. It could just be books you like or any any. Any types of books or sure. recommendations um, you have? So current projects, you know, I've got a number of graduate students and I've been trying to support their work as much as possible. Um, we've, we've got one of our students that's kind of diving further into this idea of holistic focus of attention. So she's been working with, you know, track and field athletes and doing different tasks, comparing, you know, internal, external and holistic focus to try to increase the, the amount of data and the amount of papers out there that are showing a support for holistic focus of attention. Um, so she's got, you know, some of that work underway. And then also going a little bit back into basic science with this and looking at, you know, how is force production changing, you know, with the holistic focus of attention, you know, how are, you know, maybe the mechanics changing, right? Because we've seen some, some outcome variables change, but we really want to dive back into, you know, what are, what's changing with mechanics or what's changing with, you know, force production, things like that. Um, and then I've got another student that, that has been more interested recently in, in tying self-talk research into attentional focus and, you know, some of the, the self-talk literature and these internal verbalizations that we're doing oftentimes are using, uh, different attentional focus cues within them. Um, and kind of looking at these similarities, of self-talk and attentional focus. And we've also been doing some work with, with motor imagery um, and embedding attentional focus cues within motor imagery to see if an internal focus or an external focus play a role or kind of, you know, enhance the effects of, of imagery research. One that is at the top of my reading list, and I still have not done anything, but just kind of browse through it a little bit is a book called How We Learn to Move by Rob Gray. And he's doing some really, really cool stuff. And I think really brings it down to a level that everybody can read and understand, you know, how, how we acquire different skills, you know, from different perspectives. Um, and it was just cool to see somebody taking the research in our field yeah. and trying to 
to make it more common, right? So that, that anybody could grab it and learn from it rather than, you know, people sitting in universities reading in stuffy old libraries. Um, so yeah, Rob's, Rob's doing some really cool stuff. And <laughs> another book that's kind of an oldie, but a goodie is Terry Orlick's in pursuit of excellence. Um, it's more of a, a sports psych perspective, but I really like that it, it, okay. it kind of uses check-ins to see how dedicated you are to improving and to performing. Right. And oftentimes, you know, we, we look at our life and we think we're giving everything we can. And it's, it's a nice book that kind of highlights areas where you could give more, you could do more to kind of enhance your performance in certain areas. Um, and the lo- the last one is, is just a book that I've, I've enjoyed is kind of from the coaching perspective was written by Lon Kruger. Um, and I went to UNLV, right? So when I was an undergrad, Lon was the head basketball coach there, but he has a, a book called the X's and O's of success. Um, and he talks a lot about cultural change, both within sport and within like business, you know, outlook of changing the culture within your, your hallway or within, you know, your organization. Um, and I've always thought it was really, really interesting for team sports because culture is so important. And how does a coach handle so many different personalities? Uh, and, and Lon's book is really, really well, well done to kind of explain some of those changes and expectations. Great. I think you provided a, a good variety for different people with different interests, but I've only, the only one I've read out of those three is how, how we learn to move. And I think you'll definitely enjoy that one. It was, it was great for me. I love, he really distills the information in, in a very uh, simple way and makes it more digestible for, for just great. everyday people and, and, and athletes as well. Well, Dr. Aiken, I really appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you. 